this is week four, and it is time for us to discuss multiple intelligences. Okay, so, for the longest time, there was an understanding of what intelligence means that was focused on the readiness to learn at any given developmental stage. This was a pretty good, pretty flexible definition, but unfortunately, we decided we needed to change that definition for reasons you will see in a second. During World War I, the military needed some way to decide who was ready to become an officer. Um, you don't generally want someone who isn't super intelligent and able to make decisions rationally to be an officer because those are the people in charge, right? So they started calling this trait an intelligence quotient, which you better know as IQ. They define this as a trait that was stable over the lifespan. Like your IQ just was what it was when you were born until the day you died. It doesn't change, it doesn't get higher or lower, it just is what it is. Um, you can see on the side here a little diagram of the different sorts of things that went into the military's calculation of IQ. Um, it's pretty complex, so don't stare at it for too long. Right, so they have this whole bell curve situation um, with the distribution of IQ, and this is where you get your IQ scores from. So um, you can see on the left-hand side, 50 is very dull. Dull being not super smart. Um, and then, you know, it goes to normal in the middle. So a score of like between 90 and 110 was considered normal um, and then anything above 110 all the way to 150 was considered really smart um, smart or really smart right so that's where the scores fall okay so there are some problems with the way we measure IQ um, and a lot of things that impact IQ for example heredity um, genetics impacts literally everything that you are, so naturally it would also impact your intelligence quotient. Um, school also impacts it. Um, you know, good school, you're likely to have a higher intelligence quotient. Bad school, you're likely to have a lower intelligence quotient. Um, and then also general environment has something to do with it. You know, were you raised in an environment that is conducive to learning? Do you have enough food to eat? Are you getting enough sleep? Um, all these things we know are important to learning also impact IQ, which is why it's kind of silly to look at IQ as a static, stable thing that doesn't change over your lifetime, um, because we now know that other factors may influence it than just, this is your brain and this is how smart you are. One of the things we're forever arguing about in the world of education um, in terms of learning and intelligence is the nature versus nurture argument, uh, which I'm certain you guys have heard of in other contexts. So um, there were two guys named Cooper and Zubek in 1958 who ran a study using rats. <laughs> um, so, you know, apparently rat brains are in some ways similar to human brains and also no one cares if you use them in a laboratory because we think they're creepy. Um, you know, I think they're cute, but whatever. So, you know, they selected and paired up some rats based on their performance running through a maze. You know, if you finished the maze really quickly, you were considered bright. And if you finished it real slow, you were considered dull. Um, so they would pair a male rat and a female rat together based on their performance. Like the quick ones were paired with other quick ones. Um, and the dumb ones were <laughs> sort of paired with other dumb ones. And then they had rat babies. So the rat babies then got assigned to three scenarios and then they were tested in the mazes. Um, so one of the scenarios was normal. It was just the straight up maze, nothing weird about it. The second one was resource rich, 
you know, there was food, there were things to help the rat. Um, and then there was another scenario in which the resources were depleted. So, you know, no, no food, no water, nothing to help the rat. Um, and then they wanted to see what would happen. So here's what happened. In the normal conditions, um, the rats that were bright outperformed the dull rats. So normal conditions, everybody has the same thing, whatever. The rats that were considered bright or came from bright parents um, outperformed the ones that were dull or came from dull parents. So there's genetics. Um, in the resource-rich conditions where they really gave them a lot of help, the dull rats had the same response as the bright rats. So once you leveled the playing field and put a lot of help in there and a lot of resources, there was no difference between the rats who were supposed to be dull and the rats who were supposed to be really bright. And then once they put them in the resource poor conditions, then the rats who were supposedly so bright ended up looking like the really dull rats in terms of their performance. So literally the super smart rats performances went down and became like the rats who were supposedly so dumb just because they didn't have resources and they didn't have help. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Process that for a moment. Okay, so one thing we know about the human brain is that there are a couple of things that either promote learning or hurt learning. And one of the things that promotes learning is enrichment. So we know that if we give you activities and we give you support and we give you all of these important things, that would be enrichment that will help you learn, right? So it will actually make your brain synapses and the structure of your brain literally change um, in good ways, right? So there's a couple of things here for you to look at. It literally affects you on a molecular level to have good enrichment and good activities and things like that to help you learn, um, especially when you're very young. But we also know on the other side of that, that toxic stress is gonna change your brain architecture in a bad way. Um, you're gonna have fewer neuron connections. You're gonna have damaged neurons that don't work or don't fire as well. Um, and that will actually make it much harder for you to learn. So an enrichment resource filled environment helps you learn better literally on a cellular level. A toxically stressed resource poor environment literally makes it harder for you to learn on a cellular brain structure kind of level. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about the students you may or may not have in front of you someday, um, in front of, you know, you may have your own children or be involved in some other children's lives. Think about how having all those supports and all those resources can help children. And then, you know, if there's a lot of stress or a lot of lack of resources, which is usually what causes the stress, how that might get in the way of a student's learning. Okay, so this interesting chart is on the Flynn effect. Basically, it seems that since we started measuring IQ, IQs have risen over time, which is kind of interesting to think about. Um, so that bluish green line is the overall IQ. And as you can see from 1950 to around 2000 or so, um, the average IQ has actually gone up. Um, so you can take some time to read through these things if you want. Um, it's not something I'm gonna spend a lot of time on at the moment, um, but just a comment that IQ is definitely not static or stable. Um, that it is, in fact, affected by outside factors um, and is therefore maybe not the best measure to find out how smart someone is. Also, the problem with IQ is that it only measures one kind of intelligence. 
Um, and nowadays, when we talk about intelligence in the education world, we talk about multiple intelligences. There are all these different kinds of intelligence. So the lovely rainbow colored wheel gives you a taste of different kinds of intelligences. You know, you could be musically intelligent, interpersonally intelligent. You know, that's what we would call people smart. Um, intrapersonally intelligent, like you have real great self-awareness. You understand yourself. Um, linguistic intelligence is if you're very good with words. Logical and mathematical intelligence kind of speaks for itself. Uh, you could be a person who's smart about nature and the earth. You could be a spatially smart person, um, you know, very good with seeing pictures and being able to, you know, like if you're a person who's really great with maps, you probably have spatial smartness. Um, and then there's bodily or kinesthetic smartness. And I know a lot of people who are athletic or who are like personal trainers are usually pretty high in those categories. Right. So that is a theory that has come out in the world. You have a couple of readings on this topic to learn more about. Um, so please do the readings as well as listen to this lecture and think through like which kinds of intelligences sort of fit you better. Um, you know, for example, I, I'm definitely not a spatially smart person. I get lost a lot. Um, I can't read a map and figure out where to go most of the time. Um, like in geometry class, I always had trouble with if they drew me a diagram of, let's say, a triangle in 3D and I was supposed to figure out how to measure a side of that triangle, I could not picture that bunch of lines on the page as like a, an actual 3D image in my brain, right? So spatial awareness is not my strong suit. However, I am very good in linguistic intelligences. I was a foreign language teacher, right? I was a, I was a Spanish teacher. Um, so learning languages and working with languages and writing and that sort of thing has already been, has always been kind of easy for me. Um, so I would say I definitely have like high linguistic intelligence. Um, so yeah, you're not stuck with any one of these. In fact, most people are pretty good at several of these at once. Um, so, you know, feel free to kind of think about you and your own experiences and like which one of these or ones of these um, really sum up the kind of intelligences you think um, are, are best for you. Um, also keep in mind that just because you may feel like you have more of one kind of intelligence than another doesn't mean you have none of the other intelligence, right? Um, yeah, so that pretty much wraps up this lecture. Like I said, don't forget to do the readings also um, on this one. And that is, I believe, pretty much it for this lecture. Hopefully you also did the quiz and went through all of this. And if so, you should be caught up and ready to go. All right, see you next time.